Well, we want to turn our attention now to something that has made a lot of news this week because of what took place in St. Louis, Missouri uh, on Tuesday evening, the defeat of Cori Bush. And that has put a lot of emphasis on the broader issue that seems to be happening all across the country of APAC, which and other sort of pro-Israel political action committees and other right-wing organizations, also cryptocurrency PACs, seeming com- seemingly coming together and, and really targeting a lot of uh, black politicians in a mem- number of different ways. So anyway, but before I editorialize too much on that, let's just get into it. We are very, very honored uh, to be joined here once again by Davon Love, who's the Director of Public Policy at Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Davon, as always, thank you so much for being back with us. Yep, thanks for having me on. Well, you had an important piece recently that uh, came out in the Afro, right-wing Democrats and their support for Israel, and, uh, you know, prophetic in a way because it was before the Cori Bush thing, but now, you know, even more relevant. And I guess I'll just start there. I mean, you know, it feels almost like there's like this, this... this unholy alliance that seems to be existing uh, to, you know, Jamal Bowman, Cori Bush, and it feels like it's a part of this bigger backlash that has been happening, you know, since 2020 to these huge movements that have arisen, you know, rooted in the black community, uh, trying to push things in a, in a more progressive direction. And I just wonder some of your reflections coming off Cori Bush's loss about where we are in that regard. Yeah, well, let me start with just a more general reflection of us, all right, that'll, I think, put my response to that in context. Please. You know, myself and my organization's perspective on the, you know, genocide in Gaza comes from our ideological commitment to solidarity for sovereignty for folks in Palestine, challenging the, you know, the way in which Israel and its colonial presence in, you know, so-called Middle East is an extension of U.S. imperialism. So that's our commitment, you know, gen- our ideological commitment to the issue. But one of the things that I was getting at in the piece that you're referencing is what are some of the what is the impact of Zionism on local the lo- the kind of U.S. local political landscape, right? Connecting the two, right? Beyond just the kind of obvious kind of you know the things that I just laid out. And for me, one of the things that was important to tie in is that when you think about the expansion of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the backlash to it, that it seems that Zionism right, and Zionists, folks that have a Zionist perspective, constitute an anchor to the right wing of the Democratic Party, pushing back against the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And it's interesting because, you know, you you think about many of the charges of things like anti-Semitism that people deploy against folks that make observations, right, about how those that are avowed Zionist, the, the, the nature of their political activity, Right. But in many ways, it's so hard to escape the political reality. You think about APAC, for instance. Um, and I talked about in the piece that you're referencing all the money that the millions of dollars that APAC, you know, poured into the race against Jamal Bowman. And much of the ads that were ran and much of the propaganda didn't have a whole lot to do with Israel. Right. But it was clear that they were supporting a more conservative candidate against against Jamal Bowman. And if you look at, at, at Cori Bush, who was very outspoken right, on her position for solidarity of the Palestinian people. But many of the ads and much of the political discourse in her race didn't have much to do with Israel. Right. And so to me, it gives even further evidence. And the piece that you're referencing that I that I write about Maryland, which is where the majority of my work is, you know, one of the interesting things that we're dealing with is that St. Clair Broadcasting which is a conservative right-wing group, um, company, media company, that has news stations all over the United States, in Baltimore in particular, but in other places, have been pushing right-wing propaganda against much of the criminal justice reform advocacy that myself and many others have done, right? And one of the things that we notice is that the former, a former chairman of APAC, right, Howard Friedman, is on the board, right, of Sinclair Broadcasting. Mm. Right. And even more so that one of his political protégés is a Zion is an, a, a avowed Zionist city councilman, Yitzhi Schleifler. Right. For whom he's friends with um, Howard Friedman's son, wow. who is on the state central committee um, in the 41st district in northwest Baltimore. That the, the state senator of that district, who's a mentor of mine, Senator Joe Carter, was has been one of the biggest proponents right, of criminal justice reform, and they spent all of 2023 attacking her reforms to juvenile justice, 
you know, the, the, the rise in carjacking, on a blaming that on Senator Carter, singling her out or Sinclair Broadcasting. So, so again, I, the reason why I go through all that is to say that Zionism has become an ideological anchor beyond just the issue itself of the genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza. It has become an ideological anchor for the right wing of the Democratic Party against the expansion of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And Jamal Bowen and Cori Bush are essentially um, tar- have been targets of that backlash. Yeah, I think it's super interesting because when we look at, um, and I'd love for you to expand a bit on what exactly happened with Jamal Bowman and Corey Bush in terms of the amount of money that was spent by groups like APAC to unseat them. But what's interesting about the campaigns against them is they weren't necessarily revolving around Israel. Um, you know, there was some of that, but there was also other issues that were thrown into there. Like the people run the, the campaign against them was also a against the radical like left and their you know bad policies so could you talk a little bit about what happened in those cases the kind of money that was poured into it and the role that because you know we can sit there and blame apac and apac played a huge role but right-wing democrats weren't you know backing cory bush or jamal bowman in this case they were they were all endorsing the other person well so what i'll do is um I'm going to use the example of Maryland to talk about the state of Maryland to talk about Jamal Bowman and Cory Bush and the question you just asked. You know, Maryland is interesting because it is a Democratic Party stronghold. Right. So we have a supermajority in both of our legislative chambers. Now, we had a two term Republican governor in Larry Hogan, who's more of a moderate Republican as the governor over that course of time. One of the things that we have, though, is even though Maryland would describe itself as progressive, we argue that on many issues that impact black folks, right, particularly around criminal justice, public safety, anything that having to do with community control, public resources, that the Democratic Party is conservative, right, on those issues. And so I would argue that what we see, for instance, in the Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush in those races, and as you, as you mentioned, the, the issue of Israel and Palestine was not central to the propaganda from APEC and all of its affiliates. But what you have is you have Democrats that in some contexts are politically indistinguishable from Republicans, right? And I think that's why you see the overlap in many conservative right-wing donors con- contributing to APEC in Democratic primaries, right? Where you have primaries where what's on the issue or what's on, what's on the, what, what is the election is about is about like how far left a particular political candidate is, right? And so as you mentioned, you know, the, these right wing Democrats, a part of what is happening is I would argue that the kind of Zionist political networks and anchors that I think I think at this point we can say it's a strong anchor of the right wing element of the Democratic Party. And so then some of some of the things that I think those of us that have radical political sensibilities, we have to then identify what are some of the political dog dog whistles that they deploy, right? Instead of, because they don't come out and say, well, you know, Jamal Bowman is about making sure that, you know, black and brown folks have more opportunities and that there's more, you know, public, you know, access to healthcare and more, and that, you know, that's not the language that they're going to use, right? They're going to use what I describe as like political dog whistles. And what are some of those political dog whistles? Some of those political dog whistles are, they're not effective, right? They're not effective at working with you know, the Democratic Party. They're not going to be able to bring home things for the district, right, because they're they're not in lockstep with the larger Democratic Party establishment, right? Now, they don't say that last part, right, around the Democrats, because we should, we should see that as something that would be good. We want, we value people who are not just going to go along with the company line, right? But the political dog whistle that you heard in both those races is, well, you know, they don't, they're not going to be effective at being able to deliver for the Democratic Party. When in fact, you look at, for instance, the vote against the infrastructure package that the Bell campaign used against Cori Bush, I would argue was political leverage that ensured that the infrastructure package went through, right? That it was it was leverage against the Democratic Party establishment, right? But again, the conservative wing of the Democratic Party, those political dog whistles, the idea is to is to isolate them, to make them seem as if they're not actually acting in the best interest of community without concealing what their actual political agenda is. 
You know, and one of the questions I, I'm curious about, too, and, and you, we've mentioned Maryland, and obviously there's a big upcoming Senate race there. Angela also Brooks, former uh, executive of Prince George's County, or maybe current executive still, um, and also Larry Hogan, of course, former governor who you just mentioned. And, you know, this is an area I think the Republicans are hoping – they can make a breakthrough in a Democratic state because Hogan was the governor twice. Uh, you know, he's been endorsed by Trump, despite the fact that when Trump was president, they had some disagreements. But, I mean, are you expecting, uh, you know, also Brooks to be able to sort of consolidate all Democrats and, 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 and this maybe won't be a factor? Or is this faction of conservative Democrats perhaps uh, going to, to, to flirt with someone like Larry Hogan and we could see yet again a similar dynamic of trying to use uh, the sort of the Zionism as kind of an anchor pulling things to the right in terms of the, the the discourse and the outcome. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting is that I mentioned State Senator Bobby Zirkin, um, who was the chair of the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee in our in the state legislature, who we did battle with on a number of occasions. Um, we were, for instance, one of the initiatives we worked on was uh, pretrial reform, bail reform, right? Making it so that people didn't have to, if they were just charged with a crime, didn't have to spend exorbitant amounts of money to maintain their freedom. And I believe he was either top three or the top recipient of campaign contributions from the bail bonds industry when we were fighting him on pretrial back when he was chair of that committee. He was the author and lead sponsor of a crime bill that expanded sentence enhancements on mandatory minimums, mm -hmm. right? So he has a right-wing political agenda, but he is a Democrat, right? He's also Jewish. He is, he is a you know stated Zionist. And he is now he's a former state senator, but he is now co-chair of Democrats for Hogan. Mm. Right now, what's interesting about Zirkin and then connecting it again to some of the politics um, here in Maryland is that there was a important um, prosecutor race. Right. For Baltimore County, Scott Schellenberger, who is the current state's attorney for Baltimore County, who is someone who is a driver of the right wing agenda in issues of criminal justice. So one of the uh, the legislative issues that we worked on with many other organizations um, was a, a bill. If, you, if your audience has seen um, when they see us, the, the story of this, this exonerated five. Right. Mm -hmm. A bill that would require that parents are notified when a young person's under custodial interrogation and requires an attorney being present. Right. And so that was the bill we, we worked on that got passed in 2022. Schellenberger wants to repeal that, right? Just as an example of the kind of right-wing policies, right? Zirkin backed um, Schellenberger against a more progressive challenger, right? Mm. And then he was able to win, right? So Schellenberger was able to beat a more progressive challenger. So I'm giving all of that context because also Brooks herself doesn't have a stellar you know, progressive record on, on many of these issues, right? So in some ways, it's strange that there would need to be a consolidation of Democrats to a Republican when there is a Democrat who has not demonstrated a strong affinity to be an advocate on these issues, right? And so I actually do think that Larry Hogan has a chance in this state, given he you know, two-term governor, and with, and, and one of the things that Zirkin has said publicly is that his number one issue in the Maryland U.S. Senate race is the stance on Israel. Mm. Like he has said that that is his number one issue, right? So you have this conservative Democrat former lawmaker, right, who was, who was a part of pushing the party to the right, and Israel being his number one issue that he argues is why he's such a big supporter of Larry Hogan, even though also Brooks is not on the issue of Israel-Palestine, had any particular statements on it. So I think all of that to say that I think in Maryland, one of if, if there if Hogan has a shot at winning the U.S. Senate seat in Maryland, I think it will have in large part to do with the role of conservative Democrats and the ideological anchor of Zionism to provide that additional support that a Larry Hogan would need and a Democratic Party stronghold Maryland to succeed in that race. Mm. Well, very important dynamics to continue to watch in Maryland and all across the country. Really appreciate it. Just want to hope folks go to afro.com and check out your piece, Right Wing Democrats and their support for Israel. You are Davon Love, the Director of Public Policy at Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. As always, my brother, appreciate you giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Yeah, thanks for having me. Y'all take care. Mm -hmm.